Hello and welcome everyone to DRJ's webinar series. I am Bob Arnold, President here at Disaster Cover Journal. Today's sponsor is Alert Media, and today we'll be discussing how to improve resilience with strategic crisis communication. To help welcome and introduce our panelists today, I'd like to now turn it over to Katie Gowen. Thank you so much, Bob, and hello, everyone. Yes, I am the Director of Communications at Alert Media, and I'll be your moderator today. So we're here to talk about the importance of strategic crisis communications and how it can help your organization achieve and maintain business resilience. So we have a ton of great data and information to share with you today, but what I'm most excited about is hearing from our featured guest about how her company had an incredible response to Hurricane Ian and how crisis communication played a pivotal role in that. So speaking of our featured I feet our featured our featured guest. I'd like you to introduce and meet Stephanie Rising, Business Continuity Manager at Kohl's. She's a certified certified business continuity professional, specializing in innovative solutions for business continuity and emergency response. Stephanie has more than 12 years of experience and has facilitated more than 50 exercises covering scenarios ranging from natural disasters all the way to ransomware attacks. She is committed to staff training for seamless business operations and employee well being. And she emphasizes cross functional partnerships to navigate uncertainty and strengthen Cole's resilience. So, hello, Stephanie. Thank you for being here. Thanks, Katie. Thank you for having me. Of course. And I'd also like to introduce you to Peter Steinfeld. He is the Senior Vice President of Safety Solutions at Alert Media, and he is also the host of the Employee Safety Podcast, where he interviews safety, security, business continuity, and disaster recovery experts. Peter has more than 20 years of experience advising organizations of all sizes and industries on emergency communications and employee safety matters. And Peter is really passionate about helping organizations protect their people. So hi, Peter. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. Great to be here. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Well, I just want to quickly go over today's agenda so we all know what to expect. First, we're going to talk about why organizations need a crisis communication plan. Then we're going to hear Stephanie's incredible story of Hurricane Ian, including the crisis communication component that helped Coles protect and confirm the safety of their impacted people. We'll talk about how to develop and execute an effective crisis communication plan. And then finally, we're going to go over some best practices and tips for reviewing and revising your plan. So first things first, though, I'd love to start by launching a poll question so we can hear from all of you. We will have a few polls throughout the presentation today, so I would love if you could participate in those. And we can go ahead and launch that. Here we go. So the question we're asking right now is which of the following best describes your organization's current crisis communication plan? You could say we don't have a plan currently. Maybe you're in the process of creating a plan right now. Maybe you have a plan, but it might need some improvement. Or you have a comprehensive and effective plan already in place. So if you could go ahead and get your answers in now, that would be fantastic. And then, Bob, I think let's go ahead and close out that poll and share the results. Hmm. Okay. So pretty strong number one here, which is 58% of folks saying they have a plan, but it needs improvement. However, every answer is represented here. So we have a small amount of folks who don't have a plan all the way up to, you know, we have a plan and it's working for us. So let me go to you first, Stephanie. Is that surprising to you at all? Um, I think it's right in line. You know, we have a plan as well, but answering we have a plan, but it needs improvement. Don't they all? We're always trying to get better at our planning. Yep. Excellent point. Peter, anything to add there? Yeah, same thing. It's, um, you know, there's there's plans and then there's plans you didn't think of. So always keep working on it. Absolutely. All right. Well, thanks, guys, for participating in that. We are going to move on now to uh, why organizations need a crisis communication plan. So, Peter, I'll turn it over to you now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, let's go ahead and get right into it. So crisis communication really plays an absolutely pivotal role in emergency preparedness, response, and recovery. As I always say, if you can't communicate, you can't recover. 
um, in an emergency where every second absolutely counts, your people need to know what's happening, where it's happening, and how they should respond to protect not only themselves, but also the organization. Um, and that's why every business needs a strategic crisis communication plan, no matter the industry, location, or size of the company. In the past few years really have proven that crisis events like severe weather and natural disasters can have a huge impact on organizations and their employees. Um, in 2023 alone, the U.S. experienced 28 different billion dollar weather and climate disasters. Um, this actually surpassed the previous record. It was, I think, 22 disasters back in 2020. Um, and this year, the U.S. experienced seven billion dollar disasters before June 1st. And these catastrophic, catastrophic events that I'm talking about aren't limited just to the United States. The cost, frequency, and severity of natural disasters is actually rising globally as well. Uh, as you can see here, 2023 was the costliest year on record for disasters all around the world, which includes everything from drought and wildfires to flooding and freezing. And with these incidents becoming just more common and impactful, it's really crucial that your crisis communication plan is both reliable and robust so you can better uh, respond to them. Um, now, another thing to consider is the rise of remote work over the past several years really has led to an influx of mass migrations across the country, with many people moving to coastal areas that are more prone to hurricanes, flooding, storm surges, things like that, uh, and other water emergencies. Uh, this can absolutely cause all kinds of concerns when it comes to employee safety and crisis communications. Many people that move to coastal areas may not be fully aware of the increased risks that they now face, or just have knowledge of how to protect themselves and their property during a crisis. Mass migrations also raise concerns around whether a company knows where their employees are living or working, which makes it difficult to prepare and protect them. Um, and you might even have a business traveler that's coming and going from regions that are higher risk for certain emergency situations. Just a lot to stay on top of. So again, a comprehensive crisis communication plan considers all these types of scenarios and accounts for every worker, whether on site, remote, in the field, or just out and about traveling. Uh, now, speaking of water emergencies, the 2024 hurricane season has arrived. And uh, this is the actually the most aggressive hurricane forecast the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, uh, commonly known as NOAA, has ever issued, which is pretty staggering. Um, we just had a monster storm here in Texas, where I am, not a hurricane, but a ton of rain to really start kicking this uh, whole season off. Uh, it'll actually be pretty interesting to see if NOAA amends the forecast in August or if we're actually still experiencing historic hurricane activity. Now, we're also experiencing another brutal wildfire season here in the US this year, but there is a little bit of good news. I know not so much for the folks in New Mexico right now, not in California, but AccuWeather is actually predicting less wildfires and less acreage burned across the US than last year. And then if that's the case, uh, it will be less than the U.S. historical average. But wildfires are not unique to the United States. Canada, South America, Mexico are already battling their own intense wildfire seasons. And so are parts of Europe, Southeast Asia, Australia, and lots of other parts of the world. Very few locations are off limits when it comes to wildfires and their impacts. So just another big thing uh, to think about. Now, let's go ahead and look at some of the relevant data to help bring the importance of crisis communication plans to life. So here you see Captera surveyed business leaders in a crisis communication survey in 2023, and they discovered that more than half of respondents do not have a formal documented crisis communication plan or set of plans in place. Uh, personally, I kind of find that statistic pretty surprising considering all the data that we just reviewed, uh, but there's a lot of work out there to be done. 98% um, of business leaders who do have a formal crisis communication plan in place described it as effective after activating the plan in a real crisis. And 77% of business leaders that have a plan um, actually went a little bit further and they called it very effective in a crisis, which I think is promising. If you take the time to put into it, it can really pay dividends downstream. Um, so what this data shows is that almost all businesses with a plan in place are finding it useful in an emergency. Not only will a comprehensive plan help you prepare your people for a crisis event, but it'll also help them make more informed decisions about how to respond if one occurs. And that's what it's all about. Just no deer in the headlights, knowing what to do, uh, or at least have a sense of what to do when something happens. Um, now, before I turn it over to Stephanie to recount Cole's response to Hurricane Ian, 
Here's just a quick overview of the storm to refresh your memories and provide context. So for starters, it was the costliest hurricane in Florida's history and the third costliest for the United States. So here's just a few statistics. Um, remember that Ian made landfall near Cabo Costa, Florida on September 28th of 2022. It was actually rated a category four hurricane with sustained winds of about 150 miles an hour. That's pretty devastating. Um, more than 26 inches of rain fell actually came down, which is pretty astounding. And to make things worse, they actually saw a 13 foot storm surge. So just adding insult to injury with all that rain. Um, and all this ended up doing is, is uh, it left over 3 million people without power and resulted in an estimated $115 billion in damages. That's just staggering. And then sadly, it was responsible for more than 150 deaths, which is just terrible. So that's a little bit of a background um, on the storm. So with that in mind, Stephanie, um, it'd be great to hear the story of how Coles responded to it. So I'll start asking you some questions here. We can have a discussion for the next 10 or 15 minutes or so, but it'd be fantastic to hear your story and how a large organization like Coles was able to deal with this catastrophic situation. Absolutely, sounds great. Okay, very good. Well, let's just jump right into it. So when did you actually first learn that Ian was gonna impact your people and operations? Well, I'll start off with saying that at the start of every hurricane season, we have a cross-functional team that is constantly monitoring the National Hurricane Center. So 2020, for the most part, had been fairly quiet um, until Ian happened. So typically when we're monitoring, which is again a daily activity, we will figure out if the forecast is gonna come near one of our locations and we'll start talking as our core team of our field incident management team. So we have a, a very large team that responds to natural disasters here at Coles and our core team includes my team, our business continuity team, some of our human resources team, our ROC, which is our remote operation center. They're part of our, our corporate security loss prevention group. And then our facilities team that supports our stores. We're constantly talking about any kind of natural disaster threat, whether it's a wildfire, tornado, or a hurricane. So when we saw Ian was on its way and very early news media reports were about it's going to be a very strong storm, we figured out what part do we need to, or what partners do we need to bring in now um, from our field partners to more of our, our corporate support team from our field team. So that usually happens three to four days before landfall is gonna be made, where we start these large calls um, that enacts our whole field incident management team. And our goal with that team is to really take off um, anything we can from our store team's plates, whether it's helping enter payroll for them um, from the corporate side, whether it's getting additional materials such as quick dam sandbags, um, deploying our hurricane screens, things like that. Um, and for this storm, we knew it was gonna be pretty strong, but what was surprising for me was how impactful it was. I've been with Coles for about a little over six years and we have never had to close an entire district before. Uh, we've mm -hmm. had many hurricanes impact us on the Atlantic side, the Gulf side, but this was the first storm where we, we had to close entire districts because of how wide and how intense the storm was. So with all this pre-activity that you have, did you actually feel like you were prepared going into it? Like you had a good sense that we're doing the best we can here or did you feel like you were behind the eight ball? Tell us more about that. Absolutely. What's nice about our field incident team is we, nice or not, we get a lot of practice. So we have many locations throughout the country. We get a practice um, deploying our team and resources all the time. So we did get our team together. And one of the first things we think about based on the strength of the storm is if we need a generator. Um, so we will very early on have some of those discussions about if we need a generator. Here we did, we needed two um, after the storm. And so those are some discussions we'll have, especially being a retailer, when we do put a generator on hold, sometimes those do get commandeered for other businesses who need them, which we completely understand. If a hospital needs that generator or a grocery store needs that generator, by all means take the generator, but that's one of the things that we talk about in addition to other equipment that we might need. Like I mentioned, those quick dam products or sandbags, things like that. And then one of those early things that we discuss is when do we need to close the stores? Mm. Uh, we wanna make sure that we take all of that extra angst off of our associates to make sure that they can get home in time to prepare themselves and their families. 
And we do that by paying very close attention to what's happening locally, in addition to any evacuation orders that may be placed and making sure that we're communicating with our associates. So our communication is twofold. We have our field incident management team, which is our corporate support team. And we have that structure of when we need to communicate with our other partners. And then there's the piece where we communicate directly to our impacted associates. So we use an emergency notification tool to send a message to our associates to let them know when we might be closing their location and then let them know when we'll be reopening. In addition to a message that we send pretty thoughtfully within 24 to 48 hours after the incident to send them a message asking if they've been impacted. And then there's additional follow-up steps that we take through our human resources group to make sure that our associates who are impacted are supported and we help get them through. How critical do you think communication is to your overall response or preparation and response efforts? It's such a key part because you can write all of the plans that you want, but if people in your organization don't know what the plan is, and you don't communicate with them what you'll share during an incident or after, it's gonna fall apart. People are gonna think you don't know what's going on um, or send you messages telling you what's going on. So in order to be proactive and show that you are a partner and show that real value add of business continuity planning, you have to make sure that you're communicating with your all your stakeholders at all levels, whether that be your most senior leaders or your partners that are working on the incident with you. And then of course, the end users, our associates, your boots on the ground staff who are being personally impacted by these events, they need to know how you're gonna communicate with them. So having that all in a plan so that you're not thinking of it that day or a few days before, writing it down, making sure you have it in a plan and then practicing that, making sure that it's gonna work how you think it's gonna work um, is key. In addition to learning from those communications, if what you have in the plan works today and something happens tomorrow that knocks out some of those plans, Make sure the plan's getting updated so that you know this didn't work. We're going to change gears. We're going to pivot like all business continuity professionals have to do and make sure that you get those plans updated. What about the frequency of communication? Obviously, there's different streams when you have an emergency, like you're constantly communicating with leadership and the emergency response team. And that's like fluid throughout the day, you know, as much as necessary. What about communicating with just the average employee out there? What Do you have any thoughts on that? Any best practices, things you've experienced? Do you just say one update a day? Do you do several updates? What are your thoughts? Yeah, that's such a great question. So I'll answer this in, in a few ways. So when we're on incident, as I referred to it, when we're having a hurricane or a different event we're responding to, we have it uh, in our plan and enacted that we will do our what we call our business continuity calls twice a day. They're at the same time every day. It's a calendar invite that goes out. Everyone on our cross-functional team knows what to expect. They know the agenda. It's the same every time. Again, also in our playbook, so everyone knows what to expect. And then in addition to documenting in our plan when we'll be communicating with our large team, we also put in some parameters about when we'll communicate with our associates to let them know what's going on and to your point peter sometimes it really depends on the actual incident and what's happening because in our plan we'll say we'll notify them you know at least 48 hours ahead of their store closing well sometimes it might be earlier sometimes it might be closer uh, depending on change to forecast things like that and then we do want to update them or ask how they are after the incident, but sometimes it depends on how strong that impact was, when the evacuation orders are lifted, what the community infrastructure looks like, and when we think they'd even be able to receive a message or get back home to know if they were impacted. And how do you reach out to them? Like what channels do you use? So we send a text and an email. Um, we use um, an emergency notification tool where we send out that text in the email. Um, there's also an option for a phone call, but we have found that post-disaster, sometimes those calls don't get through depending on the infrastructure that's impacted in the area. Plus these days, um, people are more um, used to responding either by email or text. So we found that we've gotten a better adoption of a response rate by just sending the text in the email. And what kind of information do you provide in those messages? I know it can be definitely situation specific, but do you try to keep it really short and to the point? Do you get elaborate? Like, how do you know what to send in a message to your employees? Yeah, we, we try to be as to the point as we can, but what's a nice feature of the emergency communication tool we use is we could craft a message differently in a text message versus an email. 
Um, we typically do the same message to a text in an email, but if we are sending additional links after the disaster, which we've done before to support our associates through an associate relief fund that we have, sometimes we will use that to elaborate on the email and send that link over so that they can easily um, get into what they need to fill that out. Okay, so using the channel as appropriate, like texting, you don't want to send a giant novel over, but email's appropriate to send more information. So just kind of gauging the type of information and uh, putting it in the appropriate channel. Yeah, and it's really important to, to be short and to the point in text messages. In my experience, I've seen that some cell phone providers will break up those messages. So a message that might look short to you as you're crafting it might show up as seven text messages, all out of order um, to your, your recipient. So you wanna make sure that it's as to the point as you can um, with giving the right information, such as your store is closing uh, or we are concerned for your safety. Please respond if you've been impacted. Um, and then having multiple response options helps as well. I like what you just mentioned there about uh, assessing that employee impact. Like, are they able to go to work? Are they okay? Do they need help? How do you manage that? Like a lot of people I talk to say, I'd like to send a message out to a thousand people that are in this impact area and ask them, are you okay? But I'm nervous. Like what if they reply back and 347 say, I need help. What do you do with that? Yeah, well, luckily we have an amazing HR team here and that's what they do during these instances is they will literally uh, be assigned um, blocks of associates to reach out to. Um, after Hurricane Ian, we had over 700 associates report back that they were impacted in some way, whether that was they lost power in their home or they lost their vehicle or some kind of impact to their home. And our human resources team is excellent, um, making sure that then either it's an additional follow-up message or it's one of those phone calls where our HR team will directly call them and help figure out what the impact was and what we can do to help support them. That's fantastic. So it sounds like communication is super important. You got to keep leadership and the emergency response team on the same page so they can react quickly to whatever happens out in the field. You got to keep the employees up to date to make sure they're safe because if they're not safe they can't be productive uh, and just kind of gauging that out there. But let's say now you've gotten, you've kind of managed through the worst of it, the storm is now over. Um, what are some of the key actions that the organization took around the recovery efforts? You talked a little about, you know, getting in touch with impacted employees, but if you think about the community in general, other stakeholders, what else did you do afterwards? Yes, yeah, so at Coles, we have something we call the natural disaster playbook. Um, this is a playbook that has all of our partners together of, if we have a very significant event, what we can do from an associate relief standpoint, but also a customer and a community relief standpoint. So in my six years at Coles, we have never had a significant event where we had to enact our natural disaster playbook. Um, the other incident prior was Hurricane Harvey, which impacted Texas. And this was such a significant event that impacted um, so devastatingly in parts of Florida, where we did enact our playbook, which put into effect some other community relief items, such as stopping collections, um, adding an additional discount for our customers, a, a disaster discount. In addition to our associate discount, our associates during that time got their regular associate discount and then our disaster relief discount. Um, things like that that we have in this playbook. In addition to some associate relief items, uh, we have now, in addition to our plan on uh, learning from Ian, um, we have stockpiled some water, flashlights, batteries, phone chargers, like power banks for um, employees' personal cell phones, all things that we were able to source post Ian, but things that were such a, a nice thing for our associates to help them get through this, that now that was an update we've made to our plan moving forward of, we, this is where we're going to stage these items. Uh, we do have them at some of our locations, but also at a third party vendor that we can quickly um, dispatch those items wherever we need to get them to. Oh, that's really fantastic. What, what kind of feedback did you receive from employees around those efforts in general or just the crisis communication um, in particular? Yeah, something that will stay with me for a while. Um, so Ian impacted Florida the most significantly, but it continued on. It went back over the Atlantic, kind of reformed a bit, came back over land. So right. when we're thinking of what field partners to add to our calls and make sure that everybody is in the loop, later on we did have to add some of our team members from the Carolinas and the Georgia area. Um, and one of the best compliments that I got um, 
about our process was a leader that I had never worked with before um, in the Carolinas commenting on how easy the process was, that he didn't have to think about when the next call was, he knew when it was coming, he knew exactly who to contact based on our calls of if he had a question about a specific store or getting a message there, and it just made it easier for everybody. Knowing what to expect, writing down how you're gonna communicate with everybody helps take a little stress out of a very stressful situation, which anybody who's lived through a hurricane or a tornado or any kind of natural disaster, the last thing you really wanna worry about is work because you're worrying about your family. So making sure that we as the business continuity planners, we as our cross-functional field incident team are preparing our staff for what we're going to do and what they can expect is key to our success. Indeed. Well, before we wrap this up and you go on to the rest of the presentation that you're going to give, um, lessons learned after action review. Like, what does your after action review process look like? What lessons learned can you share? Maybe just pick the top one or two. Yeah, absolutely. So after any kind of incident, um, you want to review what went well, what didn't go well, and make some of those updates. So not that it didn't go well, but something after Ian was... It, it kind of felt rushed trying to figure out those associate relief items. And then it was so much easier to just make that choice now. Let's put this in our playbook. This is what we're going to do if and when this happens again, because we're going to have another category for a storm. We're unfortunately going to have another serious impact like this. Let's put it in there now so we're not trying to figure out in the 11th hour how to get these items sourced, how to get them delivered. So that was something we did in our review, um, which we do after every incident. Um, and that was something that came specifically from Ian, was an enhancement and an update to our natural disaster playbook. Well, that's great. I, I think we could keep talking for the next probably 30 to 45 minutes just on this, but we got a lot still to cover. So Katie, I'll, I'll turn it back to you to get us on our way. Stephanie, thank you so much for that. I do want to move on now to this poll question you are seeing on your screen now. So kind of, you know, after hearing all of this from Stephanie, which aspect of crisis communication do you feel the least prepared to execute at your organization? Would you say it's crafting your messages, maybe communicating with leadership, maybe it's communicating with those impacted employees, assisting employees who need help, or perhaps conducting an after action review or report. So I'm going to give that just a few more seconds and then Bob, we can go ahead and share those results. All right, well, we have a clear winner here, which is assisting the employees who need help coming in at 51%. But again, I have to say, like all of these answers are represented here. So we do have kind of folks at least a little curious about all of these different aspects. So Stephanie, is that about what you expected to see here? Yeah, I think that's right in line. I, you know, I can definitely um, relate to the assisting employees who need help piece. If, if you're in a smaller company, that can definitely be intimidating. Absolutely. Peter, do you have anything to add there? I just hope I didn't influence everybody because earlier in the presentation, I said that we get the question all the time. How do I help people who say they need help? <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, that's that's exactly, we hear it all the time. It, it's definitely something you got to think about and put some uh, thought into before the disaster happens. Absolutely. Well, Stephanie, can you just give us a few more details about Cole's crisis communication plan and maybe how other organizations can learn from it and perhaps even emulate it? Absolutely. So as I was mentioning, we do have a natural disaster playbook here. And these are just some pieces of you know the plan that we have in here. And feel free to take from this what works for everybody. Um, and if you have other ideas, feel free to send me an email after this. You'll have my email on the last slide. Um, but some things that I would definitely touch on is making sure that you do have a framework in your plan of who is on this team, who is on this response team, because we as a business continuity team, we're typically small teams, right? I think the largest team I've seen is six people. That's pretty small, um, especially uh, for a large company. And it can be as small as one or two people. So make sure that you write down who your partners are, what the roles and responsibilities are, and then make sure that you train on the plan. Even if it's a meeting once a year or twice a year to review what's in the plan, go through it, pretend that you're having an incident or use it during an actual incident when you actually have to activate the plan. Know what those steps are and how you're gonna communicate with your team to get the plan started, um, get the team together. 
and then really figuring out what your cadence will be of your ongoing communications. It's not just, we sent out a message, this hurricane is happening. Um, what else are you going to do? Make sure that the, the communication plan is in the, your playbook. And then make sure, um, keeping in mind that your plan might need to change. Um, so we might write our plan down and it looks great on paper, but review how the plan worked, how it didn't work. Did anyone even look at it during the incident? What changes do you need to make? Do you need to shorten it, be less wordy? What do you need to do to make sure that you can actually use it as a tool during an incident? And going through that framework, you know, mentioning like the roles and responsibilities, if you have access to an emergency communication tool, write your templates in advance. Uh, it can be kind of um, make people nervous um, when they're sending a message, especially if you're sending it to 70,000 people like I did earlier this week, for example. It can be a little stressful. So write down your templates ahead of time, have them ready to go. And if you have an HRIS system that can talk to your emergency notification tool, building dynamic groups will save you so much time and you won't have to think about exactly who you need to send it to. Um, for example, we have ours based on the work location that comes straight from our HRIS data that syncs nightly with the tool that we use. And I know if I'm gonna send a message to South, Southern Texas right now about Tropical Storm Alberto, I know it's going to the right people. And knowing who and who's going to send a message, what message you're going to send, and then when, write that out, especially in your plan. We, as the smaller teams of the business continuity team, you may not be the one sending the message all the time. You may train additional initiators, make sure that they know who's sending when during what event and which templates they're supposed to use. Um, and getting back to who's responsible for what and the cross-functional team, you can write it down all day. Make sure that you practice it. Make sure that your partners know what this means. You know, we know what it means. We wrote the plan. We are the business continuity professionals, but not everybody does this every day. So make sure you practice it with them so that they know what's expected of them. And then training. This is such a key thing that we do um, that I think proves how successful the process is. Um, making sure that the training is easy. It shouldn't be intimidating for, for the team. It might be at first if you have a new team member who's added to your cross-functional team, but make sure that they feel comfortable that you are their partner in this and create an easy to follow structure, um, such as you have to send a message every quarter or you have to come to training once a year. And then that is on us as the business continuity team to make sure that we're monitoring what our team is doing if they need to send a message or practice something in their plan. That's on us to make sure that we are confident that they know what to do. And then make sure that if you need to schedule an additional refresher for your initiators, that you're ready to be their partner and do that. Something that we do here at Coles is we hold what I call office hours every quarter. Um, every quarter, our initiators who have access to send a message and our emergency notification tool, they have to practice doing it. Um, this is a way for them to feel more confident when they are going to send a message that, hey, I have, I'm used to this. I know what to do. Um, and those office hours are something that we don't really at make them attend, um, but it's something I don't schedule over. I make sure that my time is available if someone has a question. And almost every quarter, there's someone that wants me to you know, answer a question or sit with them while they send their message. Do those things um, to make sure that you're being a good partner and that they're comfortable in being their initiator. And Stephanie, sorry to interrupt, but before we move on, um, your initiators that you're referring to, those are the people sending the messages through the emergency communication tool. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. So I just want to clarify um, that. Yeah, absolutely. So our initiators are who has access to send messages. Um, of course, my team, uh, we are the administrators of our tool. Um, but of course, being as large as we are, we can't be the only ones that send a message. So we train additional teams within our field incident management team core group who also has access to our emergency notification tool to send messages. Got it, thank you so much. And then your plan is great. I'm sure it looks great. You have your logo, it looks really pretty. You have to make sure you know how to activate the plan and that people have gone through it with you. Everybody knows what to do. So if you've gone through training with everybody, that helps so much in them sending a message live during an incident but also just getting the team together. So if you have a large cross-functional team, it can sometimes feel like a public speaking event because there'll be hundreds of people on your calls and you have to 
keep to your agenda, get everybody on the call, be as efficient as possible. Um, and going through just making sure that that works how you expect it to um, it is such a good thing to, to do and make sure that you're ready to activate. Um, those messages I mentioned earlier, having a template, make sure you're ready to proofread if you have to make any changes on the fly. You can put in great template messages and make sure that you're gonna add, this is the city, this is the state, this is the natural disaster event. Just make sure like that you're practicing yourself of how did I write this? Does it make sense? And then being able to confirm your recipients very quickly goes back to building those dynamic groups, which hopefully your emergency notification tool can talk to your HRIS system. So you don't really have to think about it. However, you will likely need to have manual groups as well to either have your field incident team who might sit at your corporate office and not be personally affected, but need to see that message. Or for example, we typically do include our field human resources partner in our messages. So we will send our message to our dynamic group of our store locations, but then add a few individuals or a group of our core um, team of our field incident team, which is a manual group which brings in the item that you should also have in your plan of making sure your manual groups are maintained and updated, whether that's on a quarterly cadence or some other cadence that works for you. And I kind of mentioned this earlier, but being flexible, um, that's what we do, right? This is continuity professionals, we pivot, that's what we do. You can come in one day and think this is how your day is gonna go, something will happen and you have to totally change course for that day. So that's what we do, that should be in your plan and adaptable as well. And then the ongoing communications, you know, we have the templates, that's great. We have the plan of when we're gonna communicate, that's great also. But each emergency is gonna be just a little bit different. So making sure that we have a plan for how we're gonna get resources to your associates, your, your employees as quickly as possible, and knowing that we might need to send additional messages. So typically you might have in your plan, we're gonna send three messages, one when the location closes, one to ask if they've been impacted, and the third when they're reopening. Well, depending on the event, you might have to send additional messages. So knowing that you might have to do that, keep that in mind for coverage, especially if your event is happening overnight or over a weekend. And then making sure that you do what you say you're gonna do. So to get that buy-in from your employees and that trust of the, your message that you're sending, um, maybe do a, an exercise with them. I mentioned earlier that this week I sent a message to 70,000 people. Well, that was our annual notification exercise. So we have lots of folks on our Gulf Coast and Atlantic Coast that are used to getting one of our messages, but some people that are more inland might not ever get an actual emergency notification, which is a good thing but we still want them to see what the message looks like. We want them to know what to expect and we want them to be able to respond back to us. So we do that once a year. We tell everybody when it's happening so that they can make sure their contact information is updated. And we do what we say we're gonna do so that we can show them how it's gonna look and get that buy-in and know that they can trust those messages when we're sending them. And then again, plans are living documents. This is something I say all the time. So after an incident, make sure that you're reviewing your plan. And this could be after an exercise too. Anything that comes up that's new, I think is good. Add it into your plan. Make sure that you're continuously making sure your plan is resilient. And then if there are any action items for teams that they need to get an additional vendor or they need to approach something differently or figure out if the system has an offline mode, whatever it may be, make sure that you're documenting what those are, figuring out who owns it and making sure that you give them a deadline, not just, hey, let's get this updated. Make sure you are responsible for your partner, making sure that they get their information updated. And then perhaps you need a bigger update to your business continuity plans. Um, this is your crisis playbook, but maybe there's something big that needs to be added to all of your business continuity plans or other plans throughout the company. And this is the biggest thing, right? How do you get the buy-in on your plan? You know, we all, you know, drink the Kool-Aid. We know that this is important. So the best advice that I could leave um, for everybody of how to get your leadership buy-in is to really show the value of your plan by practicing, by doing an exercise, by training, and being the doer of all the things, um, or being the quarterback. So knowing that people can rely on you to know which partners need to be brought in when, and then running through an incident successfully 
communicating how you're supposed to, how people expect you to, that's a great way to just show them this plan works and you can trust the plan. And then being really honest with your employees, um, showing them what the message looks like, for example, doing that exercise, sharing back the response rate so that there could be follow up if anyone was confused on what the message was or they didn't have their contact information um, in the system for us to reach them, things like that. And that why is so important to share. And we do multiple communications um, through our internal systems as well before we do this exercise, really explaining why we need the contact information so that we can reach them during an emergency. Do you find typically that people understand that once you explain the why and they're like, oh, okay, I'm glad you Absolutely. said that. Yeah. Absolutely. So if you run into someone who doesn't want to share their you know, cell phone number, for example, we do have a way in our HRIS system to make that private so people can't see it, but our emergency mm -hmm. notification tool can see it. So we can still get a message to them during an emergency. And some of the key takeaways that I would leave you all with today is making sure that you keep it in mind, like plans are living documents. Make sure you tell your partners that. It's not that they meet with you once and then they're done. It's these plans might need to be updated. I might need your assistance or a team member to meet with me again. And really knowing at the end of the day, the business continuity plan falls on us. Um, so we do have to be responsible for our initiators if something goes wrong. Making sure that you can rely on the training that you've established for them, your office hours, your training playbook, things like that. Make sure you have that in place. Um, and then we all know this, but every crisis is a learning experience. So you go through multiple hurricanes, you go through multiple tornadoes, whatever it may be, you can apply all of those learnings to your next emergency. And then it, this is so normal to be scared of hitting the send button, but you know what you're doing. You have the plan written, you have practiced this, you've checked your group, you know that you don't have any spelling errors in your message. Don't be scared, send the message, you know what you're doing and trust yourself that You've gone through this, you have your playbook, and you know what you're doing. Um, and making being confident and sharing that in your program is like a very key success factor. Yeah. Wow, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Those are such great details. And we do have some amazing questions coming in from our attendees. So I do want to get to those, but I do want to launch our last poll first. And this one's going to be really quick. So, guys, you know. Alert Media has emergency communication, we have threat intelligence, we have travel mismanagement solutions. All of those can aid in the development and the execution of a strategic crisis communications plan. So just let us know if you'd like to learn more about how we can help, that would be great. You can say yes and we will get you some information. You can also say no, not at this time and hey, no hard feelings, you know where to find us. So I'm gonna give that just a couple more seconds. And then we're going to move on to some questions now, and they are coming in hot. So, Stephanie, I'm going to go to you first. Um, someone asked us a little early on in the interview portion, um, what are the triggers that are communicated to stores that would indicate store closures due to emergencies? So I think they're asking what certain criteria have to be met to close the store. Oh, gosh, that's such a good question. It really depends. Um, and I know that's not a good answer, so I'm sorry. Um, but like if, if a hurricane is coming, for sure we know ahead of time, we're gonna have to close the store likely at some point. Um, we need to get people home so that they're safe. People aren't gonna come shopping anyway. Let's just make sure we close it, get everybody off the road, back home, evacuate. Um, a tornado, a little less um, time uh, where we can send out a message um, because it might happen quicker. Um, it really depends. Um, if we have a, a power outage for like a small rain event or a car accident outside, we don't really use our emergency notification tool for that. We would mm. just rely on our, our team, our leadership team within the store to communicate with associates. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that's a good answer or not. I, I don't have the, the best answer there. No, that's that's perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think um, you're right. It's, it's all situation dependent. I'm thinking of another organization that uh, we work with now, but bef they had a disaster happen before they work with us. And there was immense flooding going on in their region and they didn't reach out to their employees, many of whom didn't speak English, and they thought they would get fired if they didn't come into work. So these are folks that could least afford to lose a car, but they were trying to drive in and they get flooded out. Um, and that was not a good situation. So 
I always say early and often um, when you have emergencies coming up, it's good to at least let people know, hey, we're thinking we might need to close down the stores. Um, not saying we're gonna do it, but we're thinking about it and we will absolutely communicate with you about it so you don't make any you know, mistakes or anything like that. Excellent point. All right, Stephanie, I'm gonna stick with you for a minute. We've gotten several questions about this, so I'm gonna to try to compile all of this into one question, but it's basically about external communications in a crisis. So some folks are asking, you know, do you collaborate with the company's public information officer? Do you go directly to the media? Do you guys post on your social media? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So it's part of our natural disaster playbook. I definitely did not mention all of our partners because there are many. And part of that is our communications team. So from a public relations in, in communication and then our internal communications team, sometimes if it's a significant disaster, we'll post on our intranet side as well to let associates know. But we also do post on some of our social media accounts and also our corporate website um, for public our public relations team to let the public know what's happening. Wow, fantastic. Um, all right, Peter, we got one for you. Uh, someone would like to know how you avoid overwhelming people with too much information or too many notifications. I'm giving this one to you because I think this should apply to it's kind of all different things, not just necessarily natural disasters. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I believe that's a definite concern that most people have because people do get what I call notification fatigue if you send them too many messages. And that's bad because then when future messages start rolling in, they really just tune it out. And that's not good. So I think two things you can think about are first, always attempt to be really targeted in your communications. So only those who need to get that particular message actually get it. Um, because like I said, people will start ignoring future messages if those past messages they got were irrelevant to them. So always try to just be super targeted. Um, the other thing I'd say, uh, number two, is just best practice, reserve your push notifications for the most critical updates, um, and then give your people another place to visit in order to get all the other important but less critical information. Maybe it's like an internal web dashboard that serves as like a, a central source of trusted truth and keeps everyone aligned. That can be really, really helpful. Um, not only does it let you better control the narrative about what's going on with the situation, but it also gives people kind of like this running full historical context of what's gone on throughout the incident. Um, and that's really important in an emergency, like that point in time information that people receive over individual alerts is uh, useful, but the full context of how it unfolded over time so people can see it in all one place can be really critical and beneficial during some kind of you know critical situation. Excellent and point. I would actually add to that yeah. on the, the the piece about the targeted communications. That's exactly how we approach it um, for our communications for our associates. We're not going to spam anybody with messages. If you're mm -hmm. getting one of the messages, we've trained everybody that it's because it's an emergency. Uh, we're not going to send you a message to just send you a message. We're going to let you know if your store is closing or there's something that impacts you individually. Excellent point. Thank you, guys. Stephanie, back to you for a second. Um, when preparing, do you perform any advanced tabletop exercises? Yeah, one of my favorite things to do is get teams together and go through tabletop exercises. So we do about 80 gear um, between our uh, distribution facilities and our e-fulfillment centers and some of our other corporate support functions and then getting our field incident team together. So we do tabletop exercises that do simulate you know, a hurricane um, or a tornado, um, an earthquake, we've done many of the earthquake scenarios. Um, and then also getting more into like our cyber resiliency and doing tabletop exercises on those. So any kind of playbook you're gonna put together, you want to exercise and do a tabletop with. Make sure everybody knows what's in the plan and going through that and making sure they know what to expect. And then does, do you do corrective actions or after actions on your tabletop exercises as well? Yep, absolutely. So every exercise, hopefully you're getting something out of it. That's the point of why we do this, right? That's again to your leadership buy-in. Show the value of your program. 
do the exercise. You want action items to come out of your exercise because you not only want to show the value of the business continuity team and what we're doing as planners, but you want to make sure that your plans are good. So getting updates into your crisis communication plan or into your business continuity plans for a specific area or additional supplemental recovery things that you might need to do for a specific building, things like that are great to learn. And that's how you learn them is having some of those things come up when you're doing a tabletop. And try to break things. <laughs> yeah, not in production, right. but yeah, you don't. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Right. when you're talking through it during a dirty tabletop, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, this this question kind of goes along with that. Um, how do you track corrective actions, and on average, how long do they take to close? Hmm. So, from implementing your recommendations from the lessons learned to actually fixing it, if you will. Yeah, such a good question. Some are very quick updates and some take longer. And then that falls on you as the facilitator of the exercise to track all of those. So it's it's very normal as a business continuity professional to feel ownership on all of the things. Um, but we can't fix those things. So there should be an owner that's not you um, to the action items. And then you should assign a date, like a deadline. And that's what we do with all our exercises. And then we track those in a, in a system that we use for our business continuity planning and then follow up. Again, that's on us as the business continuity team um, to do that follow up, um, whether that's sitting in a meeting and just talking through it with that team. Sometimes the action owner might not be any of the teams that were in the exercise with you. So you might have to explain, hey, we did this exercise with XYZ area, this came up, you own this software or you own this process. Can you speak to me about this and what we could do to enhance our resiliency planning here? Um, and that's on, on us as the, the business continuity team to own that and, and track that until it's complete. And of course, it's not everybody's first priority to do what we say that or recommend that they do. So knowing that ahead of time and making sure you have plans for yourself to follow up, whether that's monthly or quarterly on the item, depending on the severity of what needs to get remedied, uh, making sure that you have that documented somewhere so that you don't lose sight of it yourself. Fantastic answer. I like that. This one I'm going to actually pose to both of you. Um, Stephanie, you talked a little bit about this, but it sounds like Coles does send emergency preparedness, um, at least messages to remote workers. Do you guys also send them like tips for how to prepare their homes or what they need to do? Can you talk about that a bit? And then Peter, I'm gonna go to you after her. Yeah, absolutely. So we have an annual um, hurricane preparedness and an annual earthquake preparedness training that we send out as an e-learning to all of our associates. We link some um, really good pages that FEMA has um, at ready.gov about some of those specific items that you can do to prepare yourselves and your family. That's for all of our associates. And then we do um, quarterly safety messages that we'll post on our intranet. That is the first thing anybody sees when they open their, their laptop for the day. Um, so that's some ways that we do that. Fantastic. And Peter, I think you had mentioned at the beginning that a crisis communication plan takes all workers into consideration. But do you think those uh, preparedness tips are a good thing to send to, re to remotees? Absolutely. And it's interesting. There's been um, studies that have been done that people believe their employers more than they believe the government or the press. <laughs> so the more you can provide to them, the more likely they are to take action uh, versus if they hear it somewhere else. So information is absolutely power uh, during any kind of crisis and preparation can make a big difference. So I always say to work closely with your communications folks, maybe even your legal folks, just ensure all your bases are covered. Um, but it's a great, if you provide those tips, it's a really a great way to help you minimize the impact to your employees of whatever that incident might be. So ultimately it's good for their safety, but remember, it's also good for their productivity because a safe employee is far more productive than one who's not. So it's really a win-win. It's good for the employee. It's good for the business. Absolutely. Um, Stephanie, someone would like to know, do you have a crisis management team as well as a business continuity team? Are they sort of separate? That's a good question. So we actually have three different layers. So we have our business continuity team. Um, that's my team. We're responsible for, well, it'll be for all three teams, um, but we're responsible for all of our business recovery plans, uh, making sure our plans get updated annually, um, 
going through all of those things. And then we have our field incident team, which is the team I was kind of talking about today with our natural disaster playbooks, some of those cross-functional teams. So those are other managers um, throughout the organization. Then we also have our crisis management team. So this is just what it sounds like. This is like the most senior leaders of our team. And every year we go through an exercise with them. Um, we build, we facilitate the exercise and we go through that. It's a half day um, every year um, going through that with our most senior leaders of a crisis that could impact us you know nationwide basically what would it be and getting them some practice to go through it our field incident team definitely gets more practice um be, i guess a good thing um but uh, thinking that natural disasters happen all the time um, we go through those and they are a crisis for sure but do they rise to the level of the crisis management team not always um, our crisis management team is always notified about what's going on and we'll bring some of those partners in but we do have that level of the crisis team as well fantastic well we have time for one more question so um I've got a once again a few different comments coming in about this thing so I'm going to try to combine it all into one but folks are basically commenting like business continuity professionals are the best they have to be so tough in all these different circumstances so when you think about that what is the best and worst part for you being in this business continuity leadership role at such a huge organization oh gosh the best thing well I'm a very nosy person, like many of you on the call probably are. So I like to know everything about everything. Um, my job is one of the best jobs uh, ever. I get to help everybody um, the best I can. Um, and I don't, I can't, this is gonna sound like such a cop out, but I really don't have a bad thing um, to, to say. Like sometimes our calls um, can be a little tough, but I've, we've managed through so many of those calls where we've had serious impact and really our job is to be that calming factor. Um, sometimes I'm referred to as the calmer of chaos and that's what we all have to do sometimes, even if we don't feel very calm, just pretend you're calm, go through your agenda um, and make sure that you are just going through everything you can. Excellent. Well, thank you guys. We did not get to all of these questions, but I am going to give you some contact information in just a moment. But first, I would like to just provide you guys with some additional resources in case you want to dive a little deeper on crisis communications. So first, we have a crisis management plan template that you can use and download and then alert media also has a great blog post called how a crisis communication plan supports emergency management these are both completely free assets you can find them at alertmedia.com in the resources section uh, so be sure to check those out the podcast and then too of course I, what's that peter the podcast too Yes, we have the Employee Safety Podcast, thank you, which has many, many episodes on crisis communication. I highly recommend Stephanie's episode. She was on the show last fall, um, so you can find even more uh, tips and best practices from her. Um, so thank you, Stephanie. Really appreciate you being here today. I learned a lot. Um, and also we appreciate you sharing some of those personal details too, because right, humans are involved. The people always come first, and it sounds like you're taking just excellent care of yours. Thanks, Katie. Peter, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. We love hearing the uh, kind of more of the communication component um, at a general level. So appreciate you being here as well. Absolutely. And Stephanie, thank you. Like, uh, you're, you're just amazing at what you do, and I'm so glad you're able to share this with everybody. Oh, happy to do it. Thanks, guys. All right. And these are their email addresses. So you can make note of those. Of course, you'll also get uh, copies of these slides later on as well. And with that, I just wanted to thank everyone for spending some time with us today. We really appreciate your participation, all of those great questions. Um, and we hope to see you at a future Alert Media webinar.